Good morning and a very warm welcome everyone to the European Sustainable Energy Week 2022 under the topic Going Green and Digital for Europe's Energy Transition. Wow, it's so great to see so many of you back together here in Brussels at the Charlemagne Building of the European Commission after two years of having hold the European Sustainable Energy Week online. But it's also great to know that there are so many of you joining us online from all over Europe and all across the world. Because this is the 16th edition of the European Sustainable Energy Week, but it's the first one where we take an entirely hybrid format and hybrid approach to the European Sustainable Energy Week. So some of you are here in person with us, some of you might be joining online. For some of you, this might be the first time or one of the first times at the European Sustainable Energy Week. Some may have been around for the past five, ten, even the past 16 years of the uh, Sustainable Energy Week, joining us year after year. But whether you're a newbie or a veteran, your participation across the conference is going to be crucial. You're going to get the chance to ask questions, also to answer questions and share your thoughts throughout the different sessions. And also, you'll be able to keep the conversation going through social media. Already from the very beginning, we encourage you to use the hashtag EUSEF2022, that's E-U-S-E-W 2022, to share your thoughts, your impressions, the things you may agree with, the things you may disagree with, your photos from a memorable conference. We look forward to hearing your thoughts also online. So let me just quickly introduce myself. My name is Anna Gumbau. I am a climate and energy journalist in Brussels, and I'll be your master of ceremony in this Sustainable Energy Week. This week, I'll be guiding you across the different themes of the European Sustainable Energy Week. Because in the next four days, we will be embarking together in an exciting journey ahead that will take us through six thematic blocks that will cover different and important aspects of Europe's energy transition. These are from Repower EU, the digitalization, energy efficiency, renewables, consumers and a fair energy transition, and decarbonization. Before we kick in, I would like to just uh, share with you a couple of housekeeping rules and tips for you to make the most of this event this week. First of all, interpretation. Interpretation is going to be available for today's plenary sessions in five languages. We have German, French, Spanish, Italian, and Polish. So let me repeat, German, French, Spanish, Italian, and Polish. If you are joining us online, uh, you can use the drop-down menu to select the language you would like to listen in. For the rest of the policy, for the rest of the sessions and the rest of the policy conference, the sessions will take place in English. Now, for those of us who are here in Brussels in the room, probably the question that I always uh, get asked and that you probably asked yourselves a few times already, what is the Wi-Fi password? Uh, we're going to get, I think, this slide uh, shortly with us, or maybe some of you were able to catch it already. Otherwise, worry not, because we will have it present throughout the different conference uh, rooms throughout the whole week, so you'll be able to, to get it. Don't worry about that. Now, if you're with us, whether you're in person or you're online, you're part of our online platform as well. So let's review some of its main features. Those of you joining us online, you can follow the different plenary and policy sessions streamed in the live stage. And you can also create your own schedule, adding any session to your own personal agenda that you would like to attend and make sure to keep them all uh, in one place. If you happen to miss any session that you really wanted to see, worry not, we got you covered because the replay of each one of the sessions are going to be available shortly after the event. We will also have a networking feature. So if you would like to connect, to network, to speak with other attends attendants at the European Sustainable Energy Week, you'll be able to book one-on-one -on -one meetings with, uh, with them. And if you have additional questions or issues with the platform, don't worry because we have a support service that will be able to answer any questions or support you in any way. Also, throughout the next four days, make sure to check the Energy Fair, where we will have several organizations and exciting projects that they will be showcasing their work, both on-site and online. Some of them might only be with us here in person for a couple of days, but all of them will have a remote stand, so make sure to check it out. Well, I hope the rules were clear, so that's all you need to know to make the most of this week. Now, let's see what we have in store for today on this first day of the European Sustainable Energy Week. 
We will be shortly kicking off with the opening session led by European Commissioner for Energy, Kadri Simpson, and several distinguished guests whom I'll be introducing shortly. Then we will get inspired by some great projects and people making a difference in the renewables and energy efficiency space at the European Sustainable Energy Awards Ceremony, so stay tuned to find who the winners this year are going to be. Next up, also here at the plenary room, we will have the debate with the European Sustainable Energy Week ambassadors, looking into some of the most pressing issues in Europe's energy sector and energy landscape. And then we will have a lunch break, and shortly after, I'll give the floor to my colleague Dylan Ahern, who will lead the European Youth Energy Day. Because this one, 2022, is the European Year of Youth, and youth will have a strong say throughout the conference here at the European Sustainable Energy Week. Now, without further ado, the moment we were all expecting, let's get the opening session started. So let's get this opening session started today. I would first like to briefly introduce the speakers that will be joining us uh, today. Uh, first, I would like to introduce the European Commissioner for Energy, Kadri Simpson. We will also have uh, a video message by Josef Sikela. He's the Minister of Industry and Trade of the Czech Republic, currently holding the rotating EU Council presidency, who couldn't be with us, but he still wanted to greet us through a video message. And we will also hear from Mr. Tomasz Proza, Special Envoy for the Czech Presidency at the Ministry of Industry and Trade, joining us here in Brussels. Joining us online will be also Mr. Herman Haluschenko. He's the Minister for Energy of Ukraine. Also with us, representing the European Parliament, is Ms. Pernille Weiss, a member of the European Parliament. And last but not least, we'll also have with us Davis Ruben Sekanmua. He's a climate activist from Uganda and a project manager at the Rise Up Movement and co-founder of One Million Activist Stories. So, Commissioner, thank you very much for having us today here at the European Sustainable Energy Week. The floor is yours. Thank you, <coughs> ladies and uh, gentlemen. Good morning. And welcome to our EU Sustainable Energy Week 2022. It's very exciting to see people joining um, from all over Europe and beyond today. And this is my third Sustainable Energy Week as the EU Commissioner for Energy. And, uh, and I, can say, I can say that uh, the most important one so far at also last week, we were seeing the beginning of the surge in energy prices across the EU. We didn't know it was the beginning of one of the stormiest years for global energy in decades. Our biggest supplier a year ago is now one of the biggest threats to our energy security. 13 EU countries have had disruptions in their energy supply. Prices across the Union for energy are higher than we could have imagined. And all of this volatility means um, we are facing the greatest energy crisis in generations. That's why this is such an important moment for this year's EU Sustainable Energy Week. Last year, in my opening speech, I talked about the green transition as our guiding light, directing all of our actions towards one goal, reaching net zero by 2050. A lot has changed since then. As I said, um, our energy reality might look very different now than a year ago, but our aim remains the same, becoming climate neutral. A green and a clean system is the only way we can ensure our security in the future. Energy security, economic security, and security from the impacts of our changing climate. That's why boosting renewables is one of the central pillars of our Repower EU plan, our strategy to remove Russian fossil fuels from our energy system for good. We are already on the right path, seeing positive results. Offshore and solar are now the cheapest electricity on offer. Since last year, there is a trend of clean energy technologies increasing in production. And the EU is a world leader in wind and energy technologies manufacturing. Two-thirds of global revenues are generated by EU companies. 
but we are talking about an energy system of the future based on the technology of the past. That's why digitalization has to go hand in hand with boosting our renewables. Digitalization will be the backbone of that clean and green system, making our homes smarter and more efficient, and our grids more flexible and resilient. We also know that knowledge is power. So digitalizing means we can take more target actions when they are driven by real-time data. And in a couple of days' time, we are launching our digitalization action plan on what that digitalized energy system of the future looks like. Everything I have described sets the scene for this year's Sustainable Energy Week discussions. But despite the current crisis, this week isn't about focusing on the bad. It's about celebrating the good. And we are doing that over 40 events. A mix of the expected ones you have come to know over the past few years, as well as some exciting new additions. This week's award ceremony is taking place directly after the opening ceremony. On one hand, we have the old favorites like the Woman in Energy Award and the Young Energy Trailblazers Award. But we are also launching a brand new honor called a Local Energy Action Award. The awards are always a highlight of the week. Projects and individuals that transform our energy landscape and the role models about to inspire the next generation of energy actors. Today, you are also going to hear the expert knowledge during the debate of ambassadors on the Repower EU plan, um, ideas on how going green and digital could be key to our energy independence. Vision doesn't just come from the experts. 2022 is a European year of youth. So this afternoon, we are focusing on the next generation of EU energy leaders. The projects and the initiatives of young people who are already making waves in the energy transition. Above all, what really makes this week is the chance to hear all of the voices of the energy transition. Expert, citizen, entrepreneur, policymaker, during the next few days, we want to hear and debate ideas on all the topics I have mentioned and more. We want to honor the work of current leaders and support the leaders of the future. We want to hear about the biggest challenges you are facing and bring together Europe's brightest minds to come up with the solutions. This is your chance to set the tone for sustainable energy debate in the next 12 months. So let's make the most of it. And now I have given you a flavor of what's to come. Let's get started. So without further ado, I have the great honor of declaring the 2022 EU Sustainable Energy Week officially open. Right, we have all heard the European Sustainable Energy Week 2022 is open. As, as Commissioner Simpson has said, indeed, we are facing an extremely complex uh, context in, in which the European Sustainable Energy Week is taking place. But I believe that the program that we're going to have in the next few days is also going to have, give us plenty of reasons for, for hope indeed. Um, now, also joining us uh, today, well, he couldn't uh, be with us, but he sent also a, uh, a video message, is uh, representing the Czech presidency of the Council of the EU, the Minister of Industry and Trade of the Czech Republic, Mr. Josef Zikala. He couldn't be with us here in Brussels, but he sent us a video message. So we can have the video. Dear ladies, dear gentlemen, I am really pleased and honored to have the possibility to address you in this special occasion of the European Union Energy Sustainable Week. Firstly, I would like to apologize that my working agenda did not allow me to be with you in person. As I consider sustainable energy a key priority for the future of the European Union, I decided to speak to you at least via a pre-record message. The second Czech presidency of the Council comes at an unprecedented time of war in Ukraine, 
which dramatically affects energy markets. Energy has thus become the main priority of the Czech presidency. Our priorities as a presidency are straightforward. Work fast on winter preparedness, lowering of prices and freeing the European Union from the dependence on fossil fuel imports from the Russian Federation, while making sure we keep the tempo on the legislative proposals from the Fit for 55 package. As you have seen, the Czech Presidency knows how to move effectively with three extraordinary meetings of energy ministers before the end of this month. At the first one in July, we managed to adopt a regulation on reducing gas consumption in the shortest time ever. I believe that it was a clear signal to all that the European Union is united and is able to act quickly in response to the energy war led by Russian dictator Vladimir Putin. The adopted regulation will help us overcome the coming winter as well as reduce the European Union's dependency on Russian gas. At the second Extraordinary Energy Council in early September, we addressed the issue of the dramatic rise in energy prices and gave clear direction to the Commission for its work on energy issues. And we will agree on the legislative proposals this Friday at the next Extraordinary Energy Council. Besides these extraordinary and unplanned activities, the Czech Presidency does not neglect the legislative proposals already on the table. As you know, the Czech Presidency addresses several legislative proposals from the 455 package in different stages of negotiations. We will continue to pursue a package approach and will assess, depending on developments, whether there is a chance to finalize some of the proposals already during our presidency. A balance needs to be struck between ambition and realistic options. We will need the full cooperation and a degree of flexibility from the European Parliament as well. This is a task for all of us and an important tool to ensure the European Union's energy independence and security. I believe in an ambitious outcome that will reduce our energy import dependency on Russia and thus reduce our currently high energy bills. It must be fair and socially acceptable even for the most vulnerable citizens. Ladies and gentlemen, we are at the breaking point of the future of European Union energy and climate policy. The unjustifiable war on Ukraine was a clear signal that the European Union must get rid of its dependency on Russia, must speed up energy transition and must look for new reliable partners. In these regards, I appreciate the opportunity to address these topical issues also during the European Union Energy Sustainable Week. Let me wish you fruitful discussions and interesting outcomes. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Sikala, for outlining some of the key issues that are bringing us together at the European Sustainable Energy Week this year, as well as the priorities of the Czech presidency. I believe that the Czech presidency has inherited a very busy uh, agenda on top of the legislative files already under play. And we'll get to hear also from Mr. Tomasz Proza. He's a special envoy for the Czech presidency at the Ministry of Industry and Trade of the Czech Republic. The floor is yours. Um, good morning to everybody and first of all uh, let me apologize because I think all this evening is a fault of the Czech presidency. Our first presidency in 2009 started with a gas crisis, some of you may still remember. The second Czech presidency again has a huge energy crisis so again our apologies for that. But uh, 
Let me uh, very briefly just uh, give you a bit more details to follow up on what my minister said and uh, give you details on the files uh, we're working on so that you can frame the discussions during the whole week of what hopefully will come very quickly. First, uh, the climate uh, part of the, the package. Uh, and I th specifically say, I think for us, it is the far first part because, yes, we are pushed to focus a lot on the energy. Uh, we have the advantage of working very well with Kadri and her team and very effectively. But the uh, climate uh, part of Fit for 55 package is what matters to Czech presidency very much. That's why we also started uh, the trialogues on the overall revision of the EU ETS system on CBAM already in July, before the summer holidays. Uh, the rest of the trialogues started in uh, early uh, September, and the trialogues on the Social Climate Fund, again, something very important for many of our regions, uh, has already directly started on the technical level so that we can move as quickly as possible. And of course, there are limits, so we're trying to do as much as we can. Um, and a few weeks ago, we actually ran into the limit of having no more rooms and no more interpreters at the council building. So again, that also shows you how fast we want to move, but there are technical constraints we're dealing with. Uh, as for the energy part of the package, uh, of course, the two key highlights will be the Energy Efficiency Directive and the Renewables Energy Directive, uh, which, uh, again, our French uh, predecessors uh, finished with the general approaches at the end of June. Uh, however, uh, they built the general approaches on the old proposals. In the meantime, we had Repower EU proposals. Uh, we have, of course, uh, uh, very ambitious uh, plans of uh, the European Parliament. So again, I think perennial, uh, we will uh, need to have uh, not only a lot of meetings, but I think also a good uh, understanding of how fast we want to move, because I think we have no time to lose and uh, we need to find a reasonable compromise, because for many countries, their investment uh, funds uh, have been depleted. For most of the companies, after COVID, after energy crisis, there is also lack of uh, investment funds. So again, we need to also take that into account to move as quickly as possible. And as uh, already mentioned by my minister, I want to emphasize that uh, for the moment, we're sticking to the package approach to the whole Fit for 55 discussions. But again, if we see there are opportunities to close some parts of the package uh, quickly enough, uh, we will want to do so to make sure we keep moving, that uh, we are not stuck because of a single file and do not delay all the other discussions, because I believe there's no time to lose. We all see that with the climate change, even uh, people who used to deny climate change a year or two ago, I think, realized uh, what they see in the last uh, two summers, uh, that there is no time to lose. A final point, uh, which sometimes gets overlooked in the whole discussion, that is the taxation issue. Uh, you know, there's the energy taxation discussion. Uh, we'll have a political debate at the December ECOFIN meeting. Uh, Finance ministers, and I used, I used to actually spend four years at the finance ministers, the deputy ministers for the EU, so I can say that finance ministers are complicated in these discussions. Uh, but we believe that uh, we'll have at least some breakthrough on the minimum taxation levels and probably the length of the transition period. That will be a big uh, challenge uh, given the current environment. Also, we see a lot of uh, careful uh, attention to the uh, taxation of the energy products for households. And again, it might be a sticking point for some countries. Uh, other things, the smaller files, I think we'll manage to get general approaches as much as possible and make sure we want to do that, while at the same time, again, I want to thank Kadri for that once again, dealing with all the energy crisis issues we have. And I think we are already, I think, broke the record with three extraordinary energy councils in the first three months of the presidency. So again, I'm afraid you'll see a lot more of us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Prosa. There is indeed no time to lose in a busy schedule of, of negotiations ahead with the key legislative files, many of which we'll get to, to discuss in the next few days. Now, um, Russia's tragic war on Ukraine is going today to its 215th day. And in spite of that, the Ukrainian government and its citizens have put forward impressive plans to build back greener after, after the war. We will get to hear much more about this from the U Ukraine's Minister for Energy, Mr. Herman Halushchenko, who couldn't be with us in Brussels, but is still joining us online today. Mr. Halushchenko, welcome. Are you with us? Uh, dear colleagues, 
Can you hear us? Yes, yes, I can. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, uh, good morning, Commissioner Simpson, Your Excellencies, uh, dear partners. Unfortunately, due to the last minute urgent developments, the Energy Minister Galushenka couldn't join you today at the open. Uh, and I'm sending, as the Deputy Minister, the world so gratitude for your support in Ukraine on behalf of the Minister as well as every Ukrainian. Let me, as the Deputy Minister of Energy, share some main thoughts with you. Ladies and gentlemen, it has been 215 days since Russia launched an unprovoked and unjustified full scale invasion of Ukraine. It's been seven months we have been fighting for our freedom. We have been fighting for our sustainable future. As Ukrainian energy infrastructure suffers from continuous shelling, bombing and air strikes, I would like to ask you one question. What sustainable energy actually means? In the nature, electrons, atoms and molecules are politically neutral. It is rather the way we use them makes a difference. Some may use them to bring you heat, fight, light, food and water. The others will make the energy to fuel evil, death and tears. Several months ago, we were shocked by the occupation of Zaporizhia nuclear power plant in Ukraine, the biggest European nuclear power plant, and have been living even since under the permanent threat of a nuclear catastrophe, which may be provoked by the Russian reckless behavior. A few times we were just a small step from it. On 19th of September, Russia shelled South Ukrainian nuclear power plant Pivdano Ukrainska and PP in Mykolaiv region in yet another effort to threaten the world with a nuclear disaster. Nowadays, as we speak, the civilized world is discussing potential consequences of a Russian nuclear strike and possible response. How can we are discussing these matters in 21st century? Haven't we learned anything from our non so distant past? The Parisian nuclear power plant is a peaceful nuclear pr project. Putin's weapons are not. Both are based on a similar physical process, and both are used by the Russian criminal authoritarian regime to terrorize the rest of the world. Similar story with oil and gas. From February 24 to August 24 of this year, the Russian Federation received 158 million US dollars in profits from the export of energy resources. At the same time, Russian spending on keeping its authoritarian regime, military, police, FSB, border guards, and so on, in 2021 amounted to almost the same 160 million US dollars. In some countries, such profits are used to boost the welfare of citizens in Russia to fuel the war against Ukraine. Moreover, the Russian regime weaponized even the supply of the commodities for the sake of its geopolitical fantasies. The coal, coal and oil are used not to bring heat and light, but to divide, split, and terrorize and to kill and destroy cities and kill civilian people. Dear participants, there should be another dimension of sustainable. We should ask ourselves how 
me energy uh, how my energy is produced used and who benefits this is really important question benefits of our energy how we use it it is with this question in mind the civilized world introduced respective measures sanctions against the russian federation including in the energy field there is no simple solutions but limiting inflow of cash will significant undermine russian ability to finance its its soldiers we need to keep this pressure on the aggressor as long as the war goes on and until all the damages are repaired. The energy war has started by Russia years earlier, with strengthening its monopoly in energy supply and afterwards cutting off gas export to Europe. We in Ukraine now well where energy dependence can lead to. We have been experiencing energy pressure for more than 30 years already. We have managed to make our warnings and to elaborate a range of measures to counter, uh, counteract Russia's blackmailing. We stopped buying gas from Gazprom in 2015 we completely switched off our power grids from Russia and Belarus in February 2022 and synchronized with NSOE. We continue diversifying the sources of our energy supply and integrating with the energy market, European energy market. At the same time, there is a bigger warning to make. If there is no critical dependence from fossil fuels, especially imported, the energy security gets higher protection. Price uh, volatility, import sources availability, technical experts, and the most important aggressive geopolitical pressure, all can be strongly eliminated by the energy transition. Clean energy gives freedom and brings more, brings more peace. And this is very important messages for today, for better understanding that clean energy gives freedom and brings more peace. In 2021, before the full scale war started, Ukraine energy mix compares 70% of clean energy namely nuclear, hydro and renewables. Despite of Russian shocked and bombs, we continue ensuring the resilience of our energy system. And we are looking into the future and planning a post-war recovery, sustainable post-war recovery. The most important task for us for today is to solve the issue of nuclear uh, safety and security and to ensure demobilization, deoccupation and returning control over the Zaporizhia nuclear power uh, plant back to Ukraine. Following militarization of the seven pillars of nuclear safety by Russia confirmed by the recent International Atomic Energy Agency mission to Zaporizhia, raises an issue of securing a peaceful atom to a new level. It is unacceptable that nowadays some country with a nuclear potential commits occupation and then continue its military presence at the civil nuclear object and their pressure on the personnel. The aggressor can cast a shadow on the whole nuclear energy industry, which helps to meet climate goals and provide affordable energy for population and businesses. The world should also reconsider its dependence on Russian nuclear industry. 
while Rosatom personnel is directly coordinating the actions of the Russian military to disconnect the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant from Ukrainian power system. Russian's role as a nuclear supplier should be reviewed. Altogether, we need to elaborate an effective working mechanism to avoid such risk in the future. Ukraine has been continuing its energy transition for more than a decade and it's continuing its commitments to climate actions. Our comprehensive electricity network can already contribute to the energy security of Europe and we will continue expanding our electricity export potential to become net exporter in the future. We will pursue developing our electricity generation sector after the war and we strive to build back better by implementing modern technologies in generation, storage and smart distribution improving energy efficiency, reasonable consumption and renewables development, biogas, wind, solar power, still have potential for improvements. Recovery of the energy sector of Ukraine will be the most attractive sphere for investments in construction and future technology development after our victory. We are paying an innocent price for our freedom. Decreasing fossil fuels usage and eliminating existing dependence on Russia are crucially important steps that each country in Europe needs to make now. Only then our energy will be sustainable. Thank you so much for your support and stand with Ukraine. Thank you very much, Mr. Yaroslav Zemchenko, Deputy Minister of Energy of Ukraine, for being with us uh, today. Indeed, I mean, I think if there's a key message here is that clean energy gives freedom. Uh, you've posed many questions uh, here to the, uh, to the attendance of the Sustainable Energy Week that I'm sure we'll be able to all address. Now, next up, we're going to have the representation of the European Parliament, who is a key player in ensuring climate ambition and that legislating the next energy phase that will get us to the sustainable future and this cl climate neutrality objective by 2050. So, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Ms. Pernilla Weiss, Member of the European Parliament. Thank you so much. I share that applause with the previous uh, speaker. It's uh, a little difficult to follow, but I will do my very best saying first and foremost, uh, good morning to everyone, but also that I am very happy and I'm very honored to be given the chance uh, to speak for you for the opening of the European uh, Sustainable Energy Week. Because last year's uh, Sustainable Energy Week took place under very special circumstances the economy was uh, getting back on speed after a few years of the pandemic. We began to travel more, go out and spend money at the local businesses and restaurants. And after Europe's final energy consumption had fallen 8% um, from 2019 to 2020, we began again to use more energy as kind of normal. This year's uh, European Sustainable Energy Week is taking place under no less special circumstances as we are facing a new and very serious energy crisis that Europe's energy system has not been uh, facing since I was a child uh, and many of us uh, as well uh, in the oil crisis in the 1970s. Considering the current situation, I've been asked uh, to say a few words on the lead role of the European Parliament in supporting citizens to face the energy crisis and to increase Europe's in, uh, energy independence from unreliable suppliers and fossil fuels. 
Of course, there is a lot we can and must do, but I have only uh, taken a few uh, of, of many, many uh, things, uh, namely uh, three examples to explain how the European Parliament will also increase our responsibility in action. First uh, 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 topic is to ensure technology diversity. First of all, if we are to succeed uh, with a shorter term energy transition and the longer term energy transition, we need uh, to use all sustainable technologies and measures available. Also, and that is actually very crucial, we need to respect the fact that our member states, they have different energy mixes. Some countries are ahead when it comes to wind power technologies. Others are ahead when it comes to nuclear. Some countries have ambitious hydrogen production plans moving now forward to action. And again, some other countries are advancing very fast on development of energy storage capacity. And so it is important that we continue specializing and developing different solutions in order to help each other going forward and continue to feed the sources of mutual inspiration that over history only has made Europe stronger, more agile and richer. Here, the European Parliament is a very important platform because we, when we as the elected members go home to our constituencies and visit companies and citizens, we get a better, better quick picture uh, of member state specific developments and priorities. We can take with us the knowledge and we can share it with our colleagues in the parliament and together with the council and the commission to remind ourselves that our differences are also what will get us through the crisis. And not least, we, as directly elected uh, by the European citizens, can bridge for change and deeper cooperation amongst member states. Here, it's very important that we boost the message and the possibilities for more transnational infrastructure projects to be um, activated. Secondly, I would like to underline uh, the need for the increasing ambition levels. Member state differences are not an obstacle to tackle the crisis if we just fight for the same overall objectives. And this is why it is so important to stand strong and united behind clear and ambitious, but also realistic ambitions, both when it comes to reducing emissions and when it comes to increasing our independence from unreliable suppliers. As the shadow rapporteur of the EPP uh, on the Energy Efficiency Directive, I am therefore very happy that, happy that we are now finally agreed to binding national targets, increased ambitions, and new and many tools for the member states to really become more efficient. And may I remind that we will start the trilogues in two weeks on the EED. Energy savings are the quickest and the cheapest way to address the current energy crisis and to reduce bills. Using less energy is also the most cost-efficient way to achieve the green transition. It is something that we can all do while still respecting member states' different uh, energy mixes. And for the same reason, I'm also very happy that the European Parliament also now have agreed to increase ambitions on the production of renewable energy, the so-called RED directive. With both, both the RED and the EED, we are united behind ambitious overall goals. Lastly and thirdly, climate partnerships. And I hope that can create some kind of an active echo throughout the week uh, that we are now starting here in uh, this building. High ambitions are namely not enough. If we are to succeed with the short and long-term transition, we need to truly engage our companies and citizens in the transition. And this is really a key priority for, for me as a parliamentarian working with the Fit for 55 deals. 
And this is also why I asked to introduce a text in the EED by and also in the climate law saying that the Commission should facilitate sector-specific climate dialogues and partnerships by bridging together key stakeholders in an inclusive and representative manner so as to encourage sectors themselves to draw up indicative plans of their transition towards achieving the Union's climate-neutral objective by at latest 2050. For the same reason, I suggested that in the recast uh, of the Energy Efficiency Directive, that we establish those kinds of uh, partnerships to truly facilitate stakeholder partnerships across transitioning sectors in Europe. This is suggestion was successfully adopted, and I really hope it will survive over the coming trilogues. But also, uh, the companies need uh, to be engaged in the energy transition. Uh, but not only uh, the companies need to be engaged in uh, the energy transition, we also, of course, need to engage our citizens to make energy efficient behavior more convenient, easy and attractive. To do so, the Parliament position on the Energy Efficiency Directive actually suggests creating and upscale uh, the one-stop shops to make information easy available uh, to European citizens. And down, to the, uh, and down the very same la lane, I have proposed a pilot project on the establish establishment of an EU forum for boosting energy efficient behavior, a forum that should provide tools and training targeted towards uh, local and regional actors for them to obtain, strengthen and maintain the necessary capabilities to carry out energy efficient boosting activities. So now we have the climate partnerships. We also have the upcoming pilot project. I really hope that you will use this week's opportunity to maybe actually um, kickstart some kind of piratry so that we know how to do it when we have the legal framework in place. So to conclude, the current situation calls for the European Parliament, uh, that it is extremely adaptive and active, but also that the Parliament does not forget to listen to the European citizens and companies. We do play an extremely important role in reminding ourselves that the member states' differences are not a barrier to tackling the energy crisis and the climate uh, crisis. In fact, this is what will get us through. Um, the crisis if we just work together. I hope that this European Sustainable uh, Energy Week will be the trampoline of a lot of initiatives that was, will bring, bring us uh, forward faster and more healthier. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ms. Dice. You've outlined the importance of partnerships. I believe there's no better place than the European Sustainable Energy Week to start forging these partnerships ahead. Now, as I mentioned before, this is the European Year of Youth, and if we look at youth globally, global climate activists have been crucial in unleashing climate action, in scrutinizing governments, and also forcing more ambitious objectives at, uh, in our environment. This is why I'm delighted to welcome Davis Ruben Sekamua. He's a climate activist from Uganda, project manager from the Rise Up Movement and co-founder of One Million Activist Stories. Davis, thanks a lot for being with us. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Thank you for your presence at this event. My name is David Ruben Sekamwa, and I am an energy activist working with the Rise Up movement that advocates for climate justice for all people, especially those on the front lines of climate crisis. I would love to start by stating that we have eight years to fully promote access to sustainable, reliable, affordable energy for all communities. This goal was set seven years back at the UN General Assembly. Recent times have also proved that every sustainable goal is crucial for preserving our natural environment. So when we talk about SDG 7, 
we cannot ignore its role in climate action. The establishment of this goal meant that there was to be a change in energy production in both the global north and global south countries. When we discuss sustainable energy, this is not a commitment for only the developed countries, but also for the countries in the global south. According to the 2018 IEA World Energy Outlook report, there are currently 1 billion people in the world, 13% of the total population, with no access to electricity, mostly in Africa and South Asia. In Sub-Saharan Africa, it is estimated that approximately 600 million people, 57% of the population, live without electricity against the 350 million people, representing 9% of the population who lack energy access in developing Asia. In addition, 970 million people still do not have access to clean cooking. People across rural Africa still use traditional fuels in schools, homes, and health centers. Achieving SDG 7 means that there must be a stop to opening new fossil fuels. But we have not seen this yet. Instead, we have witnessed different European countries and corporations flood like Africa with a sole intention of extracting fossils in the name of finding alternatives to the energy crisis in Europe. This has been seen in countries such as Mozambique, where the country received fossil fuel loans to fund fossil fuel assets and infrastructure that will be stranded by 2036, but will, but will remain prone to leaking. What is more disturbing is that the development of the global south is not at the center of all this. On the contrary, the investment of new fossil fuels in Africa is locking African countries out of the needed just energy transition and only locking them into substantial debt burdens that are costing their development in the future. The existing fossil fuels in Africa have contaminated the water sources through oil spills which are costly to the health and economy of the nearby communities. If you look at villages such as Goi in Nigeria, it was labeled unlivable after its destruction by oil to the point that the people there have ended up eating and drinking oil. Right now, Africa contributes less than 4% of the global carbon emissions. But this is not a license for Africa to increase its carbon contribution. The more carbon released into the atmosphere, the more communities in Africa are affected by the effects of global warming. Investing in fossil fuels is compared to providing a short-term solution to a permanent problem. The more we dig up coal, the further we shift away from sustainable energy. Between 2000 and 2020, out of the 2.8 trillion US dollars invested globally, only 2% was invested in Africa. Now, Africa needs increased financing for cleaner, reliable energy, which is affordable to high and low income households. We need an energy transition, putting the needs of people and the environment at the center. A change that supports the coexistence of people and the environment. The number of resources invested into fossils can be shifted into the clean energy sector to make electricity more accessible, affordable, reliable. This is how we can attain energy access for all without leaving anyone behind. The African people are calling for massive investment in renewable energy. Africa needs funding from private and public multilateral sectors to finance cleaner energy access 
for cooking, lighting, and industrialization. We need access to energy finance at reduced costs per capita. The technology to support this transition is available, and the price of renewables is much lower than a decade ago. According to a study by the Rockefeller Foundation, investing in renewable energy systems for development will create 25 million direct jobs in the African power sector by 2030, while reducing 4 billion tons of greenhouse gas emissions. The only thing missing in this equation is the political will to do so. The resources are available, but the leaders need to take action now. We must make renewable energy accessible to the communities that are experiencing energy poverty now that can benefit from clean power for food, agriculture, and education. That is the definition of energy justice. And as the world is preparing for COP27, many have called it an African COP, but it will only be an African COP if the energy needs of Africa are met. And if the experiences of African communities being affected by energy poverty are highlighted. An African COP that is dominated by African voices calling out for African solutions with energy justice as the end goal. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Davis, for bringing climate justice and energy justice at the heart of the European Sustainable Energy Week. The sustainable energy transition needs to be for all indeed, and I'm sure we'll be able to also tackle these topics in, in this week ahead. So thanks a lot for joining us, and thanks to all the speakers who have been with us in this opening ceremony. We're kicking off, indeed, this European Sustainable Energy Week 2022. We are taking a short break uh, right now, but in just a few minutes, if you are here with us in Brussels, we will have a performance by Ukrainian pianist Natalia Halaktionova, who will be playing with us here on stage in just uh, 10 minutes. So I would kindly invite you to stay with us for this beautiful musical moment in which she will be playing pieces by Czech composer Milan Vorek. Now, for those of you online, you can also join the awards uh, ceremony uh, with just staying at the live stage uh, today, we're going to be starting at 11 with the ceremony of the European Sustainable Energy Awards, in which we will find out about the finalists and who the winners of this year are going to be. So stay tuned and see you in a few minutes.
back in this first day of the European Sustainable Energy Week with the awards ceremony of the European Sustainable Energy 2022. First of all, I, really, uh, I would really like to thank you uh, to uh, Natalia Halaktionova, our Ukrainian pianist who's been with us here in this beautiful musical break. And we'll continue to hear some of her pieces after the awards ceremony. Now we need to move on to the next part of the program, which is the European Sustainable Energy Week Awards Ceremony of 2022. I will tell you all more about the awards, but first of all, I'm actually here with the finalists of the Sustainable Energy Week Awards. So, hello everyone, say hi, let's get loud. Hi. <laughs> now, the European Sustainable Energy Awards recognize outstanding individuals and projects for their innovation and efforts in energy efficiency and renewables. We have a call for nominees and the finalists have been chosen by a high-level jury from a shortlist of this year's more successful projects and actions for clean, secure and efficient energy. The winners are decided or have been decided by an online public vote in four award categories in innovation in local energy action, Woman in Energy and the Youth Energy Trailblazer. Before we start, remember that we also have interpretation today in five languages, so make sure to listen either uh, in whatever language uh, you would like. So there's German, French, Italian, Spanish and Polish. And to kick in with the awards ceremony of this year, I'm delighted to introduce the, our speakers and high-level juries. So we have with us uh, again the European Commissioner for Energy, Kadri Simpson, who will give us a little taste of this European Sustainable Energy Awards, as well as our high-level jury, it's Ms. Mr. Kieran Cuff, member of the European Parliament. <laughs> also with us is Mr. Julia Domatz, Managing Director of the Northwest Croatia Regional, Regional Energy Agency. Thanks a lot for being with us. <laughs> and Ms. Claire Roumet. Claire is the Director of Energy Cities, the European Association for Local Authorities in the Energy Transition. Claire, thanks for being with us. <laughs> and now, we'd like to hear from the European Commissioner for Energy, Catherine Simpson, who will give us a few words to kick off this ceremony. Commissioner, thanks a lot. Thank you and good morning everyone again um, and welcome to the awards ceremony. This Sustainable Energy Week um, takes place at an extraordinary time in energy. Going green and digital has never been so urgent and for our energy security, for protecting our citizens and for a future European energy system completely free of Russian fossil fuels. And this has been a difficult year and we are facing a challenging winter and we need the inspiring stories of the people we will meet today to encourage all of us to keep pushing forward. EU citizens feel the same way. We received over 12,000 votes across the different award categories the last time I checked. And right now we are about to see the results. This year we have four different categories. The Innovation Award for individuals uh, leading outstanding EU-funded projects that have an original and innovative path towards a clean energy transition. Then the Women in Energy Award, our chance to showcase and honour some of the exceptional women leading the way in the clean energy transition. The Award for the Young Energy Trailblazer, this is about supporting, empowering and catalyzing the brightest young minds in the NHS fair, the leaders of tomorrow. And for the first time ever, we will announce the winner of the local NHS Action Award, a new honor recognizing a group of citizens driving sustainable NHS action at the community or local level. And for all the award categories, we have an expert panel of charges who selected the finalists. And I want to thank each of them once again, Kieran Kaff, Claire Rume, Judy Domak. Um, um, well, there were uh, well, many experts who made their uh, contributions and, and thank you very much for putting your time and knowledge to use to help um, select our finalists today. And speaking of the finalists, 
Uh, they have been waiting already way too long. So without further ado, let's begin awarding the prizes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Simpson. Well, we have another special guest who will be joining us in this award ceremony, who is in fact sitting with our finalists today. I'm delighted to welcome the Director of the European Climate Infrastructure and Environment Executive Agency, CINEA, Mr. Dirk Beckers. Thanks a lot for being with us. Thank you, and thank you as well, Commissioner, for having me today with you. Uh, and nice to meet all of you. Uh, I'm really pleased here to be with all of you today in the European Sustainable Energy Award Ceremony that will celebrate the winners as was announced of these uh, prestigious prizes. Now, let me start by saying that already the 12 finalists are already winners. Um, they are shining examples of passionate, sustainable energy champions at the forefront of the clean energy transition. They are co-creators, innovators, and implementers of clean energy solutions. They relentlessly and persistently put their skills and efforts in decarbonizing our European society. They had to endure a fierce competition, as was announced already, and convince our members, distinguished members of the jury, of the innovative nature and the impact of their projects and their actions. As such, each and every finalist is a great example and source of inspiration for Europe. So let, let's already give all together a round of applause for all the finalists. Uh, Sinia, uh, of which I'm the director, as the European Green Deal Agency supports thousands of projects in the areas of climate change, sustainable energy, mobility and environment for a total budget of around 58 billion for the period 21 to 27. Now our projects on sustainable energy and renewables are particularly important as you can imagine in the current times of the soaring energy prices as they allow industry citizens and public authorities to become more energy efficient and independent from fossil fuels. And that's why I'm really pleased to see amongst the finalists of today also several beneficiaries from projects benefiting from Horizon Europe, which is our research and innovation flagship program, and from the Innovation Fund, which is our clean tech fund that will help Europe to become the first climate neutral continent. Now, as co-organizer of this European Sustainable Energy Week, uh, together with DG Energy. We are very happy to be able to bring together the key stakeholders from all parts of society to exchange ideas, learn from each other's solutions, and shape the future of the clean energy transition in Europe. This session is now to celebrate all together Europe's excellence in clean energy. Dear Commissioner, dear members of the jury, ladies and gentlemen, I wish you all a very nice uh, ceremony this morning and, of course, a successful rest of the conference this week. And uh, I wish, of course, all our 12 finalists good luck now. So many thanks and uh, enjoy uh, the, the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Beckers, for being with us uh, today at the awards ceremony. Now, I would like to get the impressions from the high-level jury about the finalists, about their projects. What do they have in common? What what's been uh, the most difficult part of this judging process. So, Kieran, Claire, Julia, could you tell us a little bit more about it? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I mean, I, I, I think what, what really uh, impressed itself upon me was the high quality of the entrance. Uh, and I think we all know uh, the time is right uh, to be looking at these issues. Uh, I think, uh, as uh, Commission President Ursula von der Leyen uh, said to us a few weeks ago, uh, we should have been thinking about these issues 30, 40, 50 years ago. There was an opportunity with the first energy crisis to talk more about renewables and energy efficiency, and we failed to take that opportunity. But in recent years, there's been an extraordinary flood of interest in making the green transition happen. And I certainly saw within the entrance that I reviewed, huge interest and huge technical knowledge of what can be achieved. So I'm certainly enthusiastic about what's going on out there. Of course, we have to move fast and we have to move even faster uh, because of the invasion of Ukraine. But I think 
with the kind of ideas that came through the awards um, uh, prior to this, we certainly see uh, the innovation and the dynamism that can deliver a result. So I'm certainly confident and optimistic about what we can deliver. Thank you. Yeah, igualmente, I would say, uh, indeed, the 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 um, incredible quality of the all the fin finalists has been really something astonishing. But also, it showed for me, it showed that there is a huge maturity uh, also around the energy questions and around the fact that there is a possibility to have solutions. And I think that the award at the very beginning was meant to be to be really trying to uh, increase the visibility of energy issues, of the sustainable energy issues in general. But of course today, when every European household has an energy bill coming in, there is no need for awareness anymore. It's not about that. It's really about showing that there is solutions. And I really was quite struck by the fact that most of your, the solutions that you have been really trying to innovate with or propose are some, some innovations that are basically putting the people at the heart of it and in a sense that you empower. And I think this is one of the most important uh, things that needs to be done. It's really about uh, empowering. Otherwise, if we are all basically uh, having this sensation of, of having absolutely no control on our end of the month, no control of, of the next month, no control because of these energy costs that are just basically jeopardizing all the projects we do with our families, uh, with our communities, Th then this is despair. And despair is a democratic threat. And that's what we can currently see. And all mayors that are members of our network, they really are witnessing and uh, really are in contact with people that are despair. So I really think, I really hope that indeed all the innovations that you have proposed, which are really innovations to know better what is your energy needs, what, what, what are your energy resources at local level, how you can really take advantage of what exists, uh, can be very, very soon uh, known everywhere so that it's a solution for all. Then one uh, last comment would be about um, the fact that it's also telling that uh, we have not sought any award category on sufficiency, on our, how to reduce our own needs, not if in, uh, energy efficiency, but really the one that is before, the one where you think about, okay, but it's not about this water that is best, maybe I just don't need to drink now. So it's really this kind of thinking about the energy sufficiency is not there, there yet in our world. And this is obviously something that we will need for the next winters to come. And I just like, if I may, thank you to the commissioner, because I know that you're being all over the world to protect us as European uh, citizen. And frankly, I just wanted to thank you. Finalists, well, the colleagues said rightly, well, you're all, all winners, you know that, of course. Well, some of you would like to get the trophy, yeah, right? But you're all winners, I'll tell you why. You have to uh, take this one. I'm sorry. Should I repeat? Hopefully not. So, well, uh, uh, I'll tell you why. Uh, we live, unfortunately, uh, we live in, in times when sustainable energy uh, does not mean only sustainability. It's important, of course, sustainability is the key. But sustainable energy means also, today, democracy, the rule of law, uh, safety, security, all that European values, which are, by the way, not and should not be taken as, as granted. This is the privilege, and, and we live in a, in a small piece of world when, when we do have that values. And, and this is uh, the advantage and the benefit and the privilege to live in such, uh, uh, such part of the world. This is why uh, the projects you are doing, the initiatives uh, you, are, you, are, you are successfully uh, implemented, uh, the, the, the progress and the impact you made 
uh, is, is so important. This is the real guarantee for, for our European uh, democratic, safe and sustainable future. And I don't like uh, usually that idea that we can sustainable future or al uh, an alternative future. We are going to have uh, either green and sustainable future or not, not, no future at all. This is why you did a great job and I congratulate on behalf of the jury and on behalf of myself uh, to all of you. Uh, and this is why it was, it was really a privilege to serve this, this jury. And thank you very much uh, to the Commission for organizing this. Uh, I have a memory some 20 plus years ago from this room. And it's good to be here and it's good to be with you. Thank you. Thank you very much to our high-level jury, Kieran, Claire and Julia for giving us a little taste of what we can expect from this award ceremony and the finalists. Now, we are going to be starting with the first one of the categories. In each category, we will be showing a little video in which we will get to introduce the three finalists of each category, and then we will proceed to announce the winner. So the first one of the categories is the Youth Energy Trailblazer Award. As we said before, youth is, uh, is crucial for the development of our sustainable energy futures. And it's also the European Year of Youth, so this uh, category gains even more prominence uh, this, uh, this year. So let's get to know who the three finalists are. On with the video. Despite the many benefits of renewable energy sources like wind and solar, there are challenges to overcome because of their dependency on the weather. I hope to continue to use mathematics to improve forecasting errors. Sophisticated mathematical methods are essential to build the energy system of the future. Many building renovations are made and very often they are below their objectives of energy savings. So we set up local one-stop shop services, usually public services, the municipalities can go to when they need some advice and some help for their building renovation. I encourage SMEs to enhance their knowledge in multiple benefits of the energy efficiency measures and to find the best way to be part in an energy collective. There are more than half a million SMEs in Romania. Their energy saving potential is significant and my work targets exploiting this potential. Carla, Marie, Timea, thanks a lot for being with us today. We will find out who the winner is, which has been selected, as I mentioned earlier, with an online public vote. So if I can ask Commissioner Simpson to come on the lecture and announce the winner. And I do have a microphone and I do have envelopes. So I know that uh, thousands of people across Europe voted and we received more than 2,500 votes. And out of these, more than 1,300 votes went to the winner, who is uh, Timea Farkas. First of all, uh, I would like to recognize the finalists of the award and their hard work that they are doing for uh, a clean, um, secure and efficient energy. Congratulations for, for your great achievements. 
I would like to express my gratitude to the European Commission, CINEA, and DGNR for taking this is initiative in awarding people that are working for creating the today's energy, efficient, energy efficiency and energy transition. I would like also uh, to thank you personally to my, also my family and friends for always supporting me and motivating me in doing what I'm passionate about. I would like also to thank to my colleagues from Servelect and uh, my professors and, and colleagues from the Energy Transition uh, Research Center for uh, paving my pet, my education pet, um, and uh, for always supporting me in my career. Being awarded as a young energy trailblazer, it's a great honor and privilege, and from now on also a responsibility for me. So I will continue uh, empowering and encouraging youth um, to uh, spread knowledge because I believe that, that knowledge is the main uh, fuel of uh, the energy transition. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Timia. And once again, congratulations for winning the Youth Energy Trailblazer Award of 2022. And congrats also to Claire and Marie for making it to the, uh, to the final. Well, we're moving to the next category now. Uh, next up is the category of Women in Energy. Women make half percent of the world's population, but the energy sector is, in many instances, still a rather male-dominated world. So this award aims to showcase key women paving the way uh, and uh, making a difference in our energy transition. Let's get to know our three finalists. On with the video. In the Azores, we need to have much more companies and know how to focus on the energy to fight the climate change. I had the opportunity to put the energy in the public agenda. It's a field that it's really important. If we want to move forward, we really have to work together. When somebody asked me on what inspired me to start a career in supporting women, let's say, in the energy field, I don't see it as a career. I see it as a challenge on how we can make more important steps towards bringing women into the energy communities, into the energy field, into the green economy. My goal is that next to wind and solar, water will be an important renewable energy source in 2030. I'm doing that by creating collaboration between governments, corporates and technology developers. I equally value men and women on the job. I love to have a diverse team. Wonderful. Andrea, Lina and Brita are with us also at the award ceremony today. So thanks a lot for being with us and best of luck because it's time now to announce the winner. And this time it's going to be in the hands of uh, Julia Domatz, who will have the pleasure to announce the Woman in Energy of 2022. Julia, let's Thank go. you very much. And without further ado, it's a great pleasure to announce that the winner is Andrea Carriero. Thank you. So I don't have words to say. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Congratulations to all. 
Um, so it's a pleasure to work in this sector, of course, because I really can feel that I'm, I can make the difference and I can create a better world, of course. Um, so I need to say thank you to all that voted on me, to, of course, my family and friends for all the support for my amazing region, which is um, inspiring um, islands, the Azores for me, for my company, Clean Watts, which is an amazing scale up clean tech company that uh, we work every day to create energy communities in the world, to, um, to decarbonize the energy system, to avoid the dependence of fossil fuels and external sources, uh, to put the, the, the end user, the consumer, as an active agent of the energy uh, sector. So thank you very much. Thank you, Louisa. Uh, she's my boss, she's my friend, she's my mentor, and she's a great woman in energy um, as well. So uh, thank you, thank you all. <laughs> Andrea, once again, congratulations for winning the Woman in Energy Award 2022 by the public, uh, the online public vote. And congratulations also to the finalists, to Britta, to Lina. Keep inspiring women from all over Europe. Now, we're moving to the next category. We're going to be talking about innovation. Oh, this, this, this is a very sweet moment over there. <laughs> right. Let's, we're moving to the next category. Uh, we're going to be having the awards on innovation, where we're going to be hearing about some innovative, some creative, some groundbreaking energy solutions in this uh, transition. So let's get to know the finalists. On with the video. We can capture close to 1 million tons of CO2 just from this plant. Bex Stockholm clearly shows that without utilizing more resources, we can actually remove CO2 from the atmosphere in quite large numbers. We have developed a novel full renovation concept that harvests thermal and electrical energy from the full building facade. The Envision project has created energy positive buildings and with that we can fulfill the 2030 energy ambition of the EU and reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. UseGrid solves one big problem which is the integration of renewables in local communities. What we have here is a vehicle to grid charger. The UseGrid controller looks at the consumption and the production of the whole community. And when there's too much production, we charge the car. And then later in the evening, we will discharge the car back to the house. All right, some very exciting projects with us. We have the representatives of Beck Stockholm and Vision and MuseGrids with us. Best of luck to all of you. And now it's time to announce the winner in the innovation category, which is in the hands of Kieran Cuff. And the winner is... MuseGrids. Congratulations. So thank you for, for this opportunity. It's an honor for me to be here. I have to say thank you to a lot of people, so I don't have time to uh, list all of this name. Um, the project will end next month, so basically last four years was last four amazing uh, years uh, where partners cooperate with, uh, with uh, 
the company, Irina Consulting, that is the coordinator. And I have to say thank you to, to all, because, of course, uh, my, the company, my, my colleagues there, Enrico Di Martino, that's supporting me in the, in the project coordination, but I also say to thank to the original project coordinator that is not to be here, because basically now he's uh, coordinating the growth of one month uh, baby boy, so <laughs> should not be here with us. And I want to say, of course, thank to, to the consortium because uh, I never find a uh, kind, uh, capable, uh, uh, skills uh, people uh, as uh, the, the it, it is, basically. And I also, of course, have to say thank you to all to vote us and uh, to support us. And thank you to the commission and the commission as well. So thank you. It's an honor to be here. <laughs> very much and congratulations once again to to MuseGrids who have won the innovation award of 2022 by the online public vote and also congratulations to Beck Stockholm and Envision to make it uh, this far I think you can all be very proud of uh, of being here and now last but not least the last uh, category of the European Sustainable Energy Awards 2022 this one is about local energy action because local governments and local initiatives have a key role in implementing uh, Europe's energy transition and energy plans and solutions. So today we're going to be hearing more about different solutions and about the finalists that are with us today in Brussels. So if we can have the video, please. COMACT uh, is an uh, initiative for the Central and Eastern Europe to combat the energy poverty. COMACT strength is really touching upon every aspect. So we don't only focus on the community aspect, we also focus on the financing, on the technical. CITRAC 50 is about supporting local and regional authorities to build their long-term capacities on energy and climate planning. The local authorities are working for their citizens, so all the quality of life that they are trying to improve, the resilience they are trying to build, is actually for the citizens. Mino Energy Community constructed the first project of a PV plan of 405 kilowatts in order to compensate the electricity from their members by the production of the voltaic station. With this project, we can provide for the involved members free electricity, free of charge. Right, all right, so we have the representatives of COMACT, of SeaTrack 50 and the Mino and Energy community also with us today. And we're going to find out who the lucky winner of this interesting local initiatives gets the Local Energy Action Award. And for that, I give the floor to Claire Romé. Thank you very much, Anna. So I think the question is whether we will have or not a man on this stage uh, today. <laughs> and, 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 and... And yes, Minio and Energy Community won. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizers for this beautiful event. Also, I would like to thank uh, the European uh, Commission, the CINEA, and the public who vote uh, for this award. Uh, Minon Energy Community is founded on 2019 in uh, island of Crete in Greece. Here, 
uh, here in uh, Brussels. We are five members of our community, and our purpose is to play an essential and leading role for a fair energy transition for all citizens in the island of Crete, uh, using sustainable energy sources. Our first uh, project was a photovoltaic plant that compensated the electricity consumption of their members through the production of a PV plant. Our second project uh, involves 300 members, and uh, among them is 100 earthquake vict victims of an earthquake that struck Arkalohor in Heraklion last September. Uh, this is how we, we see the first step for our against energy poverty. Uh, the next step is with the regional authority of Crete to design and implement an uh, educational program uh, in order to inform raising awareness about uh, energy transition topics in students and citizens of Crete. Uh, this is uh, Mindon Energy Community. Uh, she implements uh, the energy transition for citizens toward, towards energy democracy. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Congratulations to the Mino and Energy community. And you can stay here with us on the stage because we're going to take a group picture with all the winners. So if I can invite uh, Mr. Dirk Beckers, uh, Executive uh, the Director of uh, CINEA, the Executive Agency, as well as uh, Timia, uh, Andrea, and representatives at MuseGrids to take a group picture. Ah, yeah, don't forget about them. in our four categories who were selected by the public vote. And now, last but not least, we will have to squeeze in a little bit because I would like to invite a representative from all the finalists to join us for a group picture on stage because everyone is a winner today at the Sustainable Energy Awards. We'll have to do a little bit like a football team here. <laughs> But thank you very much once again. Big congratulations to the winners and to all the finalists for having inspired. I think it's been a, an hour of a lot of inspiration with different 
interesting, groundbreaking projects and uh, people making a difference in the energy transition. Thank you very much as well to the high-level jury, to Kieran, to Claire, to Julie, to the director, uh, Mr. Bakers, and last but not least, of course, European Commissioner for Energy, Kadri Simpson, for being with us in this awards ceremony. So next up, in just above 10 minutes, we're going to be back here at the plenary room with our debate with some ambassadors of the European Sustainable Energy Week, in which we will have this expert debate to set the scene for the week ahead. So you can join us. It's starting at 12 uh, Brussels time. Uh, if not, at, uh, at, uh, at 1 p.m. we're going to have a lunch break, and then at 2 Brussels time we'll be back for uh, the European Youth Energy Day. You can use the lunch break today to visit the stands at the Energy Fair, either here on site or those joining online. And watch the full videos from all award nominees on the European Sustainable Energy Week website and YouTube channel. So we're going to be back in just about 10 minutes with the debate with ambassadors. In the meantime, I would like to welcome once again on stage Ms. Natalia Halaktionova, who will continue playing uh, with us. So if you want to stay for this musical moment, you're more than welcome to. So Natalia, whenever you want.
Well, welcome back everyone on this first day of the European Sustainable Energy Week 2022. In case you have just joined us, my name is Anna Gumbau and I'm the moderator and master of ceremonies of uh, the Sustainable Energy Week 2022. And you are at the debate with European Sustainable Energy Week ambassadors, where we have some top-notch experts to be discussing some of the most pressing issues of Europe's energy transition. And they'll, I believe we'll have set up the scene very nicely ahead of all the policy sessions that we have ahead of us in the next uh, four days. So you'll be able to participate in uh, this debate with ambassadors as well by asking your questions we will be using Slido today for this debate with ambassadors. So we invite you to ask questions, to get involved, no matter if you are with us today here in Brussels or joining online. You can join Slido on your mobile devices by scanning the QR code on the screen with your phone or by logging on to slide.do and typing the hashtag, which is EUSEW2022, so USEF2022. Ask the questions, upvote any questions asked by other people that you think would be interesting to address and make sure to answer to the polls. Also, make sure to keep the participation online ongoing. We have a Twitter wall for this uh, European Sustainable Energy Week 2022. So make sure to share your impressions, what's making you think uh, in this debate, if you have anything that you particularly agree with or that struck you or something that you perhaps very politely disagreed with. So make sure to share any impressions with us across social media with the same hashtag EUSEW2022. Now, to kick off the, the debate and to, to lead, in fact, this debate with ambassadors, I'm delighted to introduce our moderator for this session is no less than Ms. Dita Jul Jorgensen, Director General at the European Commission's Directorate General for Energy. So, Dita, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Anna. Good morning, everyone. It is a real pleasure to be here. Thank you for joining us, whether you're in the room or, or online. I've really been looking forward um, to this. Uh, and I'm glad uh, to be able to present this morning our three Sustainable Energy Week Digital Ambassadors. They have been active, and you will have seen that most likely, over the last few months, boosting the Sustainable Energy Week messages with their communities and among uh, stakeholders across the European Union. Our three ambassadors have been advocates for European energy and climate objectives for years. They each have a specific interest uh, in this year's theme on digitalization and energy systems. Uh, and so today, this morning, we will have the opportunity to debate these issues, whether, again, you're here in the room or whether you're connected remotely. Please, uh, as Anna said, don't be, don't, don't be shy. Please uh, send in your questions via Slido and we'll try to use as, uh, as many of those uh, as possible. But first, let me introduce uh, the three ambassadors. I start with you, uh, Luca. Luca Bertalo, you are Secretary General of the European Mortgage Federation and you are coordinating their Energy uh, Efficient Mortgages Initiative. Uh, and in addition to that, you're a member of an advisory group to the European Commission on Sustainable Energy um, Investments. And to my left is Anne and Mettler. My apologies. <coughs> you are the Vice President for Europe at Breakthrough Energy, which has as a goal to accelerate the clean technologies. Um, <coughs> my apologies. <coughs> Thank you very much. And Breakthrough is a coalition of <coughs> private investors concerned about the impacts of climate change. And then the third ambassador, Dirk van Zindian, you're the president of Rescoop. <coughs> oh, my apologies. The European Federation of Citizens Energy uh, Cooperatives. You are a pioneer in renewable energy here in Belgium, where we are, and you co-founded one of the largest renewable energy cooperatives in Europe. So congratulations on that and thank you for joining us. So uh, I suggest that I ask the first questions to the three uh, ambassadors and that gives all of you a bit of time to introduce questions on Slido that I will then be picking up. And I will quickly ask the question, drink some water, hopefully calm my voice again so that, uh, so that we can continue without you all having to listen to my cough online. So um, the first question, and let me start with, uh, with you, Anne, but it's the same questions for, for the three of you if, you, if you are ready for that, is essentially what do you see as the main benefits of the digitalization of the energy sector? What do you see as the main risks? And in particular, how can we encourage citizens to embrace this transformation? Please, Anne, over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Ditte, also for uh, the kind introduction and wonderful to be with you. So let me first of all say that I warmly welcome that in this commission, 
um, that digitalization and the green transition are really portrayed um, as twin challenges. Hmm? Because uh, for me, at least, uh, they are very much about the modernization of our economy, and they really do go hand in hand. And of course, uh, that is also all about sustainability. Um, now, I like to say to my uh, team, uh, the chances that a green company is also a clean company is extremely high. And uh, indeed, um, we are seeing that many of Europe's uh, top uh, clean energy and clean technology uh, uh, companies, uh, and especially startups, digitalization is really at the center of what they do. And uh, Breakthrough Energy, we operate at the technology frontier. So I have a lot of contacts with these kind of companies, especially startups. So I want to give an example, H2 Green Steel uh, in Sweden, that I'm sure many of you have, uh, have uh, heard about. Uh, considers digitalization as really a massive driver for optimizing large-scale production of green hydrogen. So they actually started with the digitalization hmm? and, and really spent a lot of time thinking about how to build that platform that underpins their work. And I believe it's also not a coincidence that the, uh, that the founders of Europe's uh, flagship uh, battery company, Northvolt, they, came, they, they were Tesla engineers. So there is a lot of opportunity here uh, at the intersection between digital and uh, green, really as a, as a driver of uh, innovation and also of new business models. And, and that can play to Europe's uh, strength uh, because we know that Europe hasn't done particularly well uh, when it comes to digitalization in consumer markets. But here in the sort of emerging clean technology markets in industry, there I think there is a lot that is uh, to be exploited. And I actually want to use the opportunity today to propose that there'll be greater collaboration around this between you, Ditta, DG Ener, but also DG Grow and, uh, and uh, DG Connect, huh? because there's a lot to be explored here. Now, very quickly, at the level of the individual, uh, at the level of the individual what digitalization enables uh, is very sort of the production of microdata that really helps us understand how are we using energy and what is at, at what time of the day and, uh, and, and what devices. And that is really important now that we all need to cut back our energy use. So digitalization, again, will be key here when it comes to smart meters and really producing the microdata that we, uh, that we need uh, to understand our own energy footprint. However, what I will say is one needs to see how this can be uh, reconciled with Europe's uh, very strict uh, data protection uh, regulation, uh, because I know um, um, from people that I've spoken to that uh, that there are real issues here. So I think this is something that uh, that frankly the Commission needs to work on, because um, in a country like Germany, um, the meters are really very outdated because of uh, these concerns about data privacy. So this is something that I would encourage the Commission uh, to work on. And my third and final point, if I may, digitalization will be critical to build a, an electricity network that is capable of handling a two-fold increase in uh, electricity electricity demand by 2050 as stipulated by the Green Deal and as we electrify the economy. So if we are serious about this, the digitalization of our grid and power system is absolutely key. And this won't just happen. This will need a lot of work, which is why already last year we commissioned a study about this uh, from uh, uh, um, Georges Vasconcelos um, uh, that really looks into the design of uh, the energy markets uh, and, and, and what needs to happen there. My very last point will be around, um, around security uh, because um, um, cybersecurity will have to become a key focus here, because you spoke about what are the dangers. In an uh, economy where everything is connected with everything, including our energy and electricity systems, um, this uh, cybersecurity becomes of vital interest. And here, again, I have some concerns that this is not enough on our radar screen. So just wanted to highlight that as an area that needs 
urgent a prioritization, including, by the way, and you will remember this back in the day, uh, Ditte, in my previous job, when I always cautioned that the, five, the rollout of 5G needs to be carefully monitored because this is essentially the new infrastructure that will connect everything with everything. If this is not secure, then we will have major security challenges going forward. Thank you very much, uh, Anne, for those, uh, those comments covering a, a lot of interesting ground. May I turn to you, uh, Luca? How, uh, how, what would you reply to the questions? Well, first of all, I would like simply to support what Anne said. I think I fully agree with what you said. Um, I think that we have to be clear in mind what we want to obtain. Here we have to make really a Copernican revolution and change the mentality of the market. It means changing the mentality of the market that sh this should be a win-win process for all the stakeholders. And we have to have the capacity to build a new ecosystem for our economy, able to build a new flow of data which are essential to move the economy, lenders, banks, towards the same direction. Digitalization is the essence, simply, of all this. We need to have access to data, we need to be able to share data, we need to provide information to the consumer. The challenge we have is going back home and convince your partner to renovate your house. The evidence of the win in the deal should be clear to all of you. No one of us will renovate their house without having a clear microeconomic benefit in front of our eyes. This is true for the consumer, this is true for the lenders, this is true for the investors. So digitalization can help us, can help us in identifying also, allow me to say, the most fragile consumer that have to be protected by the public authorities with subsidies, because this cannot be an effort done alone by public authorities. We need the capital market to step in, and here I'm, I'm pleasure to represent more than 2,000 banks ready to take the responsibility and to put their capacity to support European citizens to make this uh, challenge. is a challenge. We have to bring solution to European citizens and digitalization is a way to access to these solutions. We have always to be careful on how we move and we need really to create consensus. Uh, I have an Italian passport, so this morning is a, it's a bit... We need to create, explain to people what we are doing. And I think that all the European authorities, Parliament, Commission and us, we have to explain why is absolutely need to take action as soon as possible. And digitalization is the best way to reach 520 million of European citizens as quick as possible. Thank you very much. Luca, and indeed we are working on a digitalization action plan, picking up these issues. But Dirk, there have been several references to, uh, to citizens. Uh, what does it mean at the individual level, at household level? What can the digital uh, digitalization do uh, to, make that, uh, to make that happen? How do you see that, please? A few years ago, um, when the, uh, the major energy directives were revised in the clean energy package, um, we as energy cooperatives, as energy communities, as we are called now, uh, we, uh, we got definition. And we were very happy about that. Uh, the transposition is not going very well across Europe, uh, so we are monitoring that. But uh, it gave citizens and groups of citizens uh, several rights uh, to produce, store. And for all of this, we, we need digital tools as well. Uh, so we as cooperatives, as energy communities, to communicate with our members, for them to communicate with us, for the DSOs and TSOs to, to uh, communicate with, with, with us as energy communities, so that all these... Uh, for instance, the flexibility of our members, they are willing to offer to the, to the energy system so that it can be offered. Huh? Me, myself at home, I still have an old, uh, an old uh, Ferraris meter. Uh, and in a European project uh, funded by Europe, uh, we, we, uh, I added several things. Well, my cooperative added several things so that it became more or less a smart meter. So that shows that we, we need uh, digital meters and that, that the smart things we can do with it, it is essential that people trust uh, the ones who are doing it. And for this, it's, of course, it's our belief that energy cooperatives, energy communities are the ideal tool because we are not for profit. Uh, these past weeks, months, uh, we've been overwhelmed. I've been overwhelmed with f questions from journalists. How come uh, uh, that your cooperative is uh, the cheapest supplier in in, in Flanders. Well, that's because we're not for profit. 
Uh, we care for our members. We want them to have green electricity from their own installations at the lowest possible price. And that's the key. Uh, 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 on, my, on my Twitter account, uh, I put in, in Dutch, so if you take profits in normal times, it's unethical, uh, according to me. But if you do it in a war time, it's criminal. Uh, so uh, we, we, have to, uh, we have to be very well aware that most people are in problems now. And we as an energy cooperative, we see it daily. Uh, also, we, we, we have to buy, when, we, when there's no wind, no sun, we have to buy electricity on the market. And, these prices are, are crazy, they're crazy. And it should be revised. Uh, we, we're, we're, as a stakeholder, we, we know what might c come up out of the council decisions. So, um, but we need serious, uh, serious uh, decisions uh, directly, let's say, as soon as possible to give people a bit, uh, a bit uh, to, to make them a bit more at ease because what's now coming uh, for, to them, that's, that's incredible. So we need trust, and, and, and there's an also another risk that we see, that is that the, the, the incumbent utilities or new uh, players, they, uh, they create energy communities themselves. And so this uh, is troubling for citizens uh, because they're in for, for the profit. They don't want to lose the profit. And so it, it, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a... It's troubling us and it's troubling citizens. If they don't see, if they don't count, count that an energy community is something that was created for citizens, is not for profit, it will, it will uh, confuse them and it will uh, make the whole exercise of creating these, this definition for energy communities, it will make it not worthless, but it, make, it will make it troublesome, let's say. Thank you very much, Dirk. And as you've said, it's the high energy prices are very much felt. Uh, by individuals, by, by businesses, by households, by, by communities. Uh, and so it is our priority to, uh, to address that, including in the Extraordinary Energy Council coming up this, uh, this Friday, but also beyond that, of course. So that was my first question to our three uh, panelists. Um, and I would like now to turn to the audience and see if there are any questions that have come in via Slido, any Anything that you would like me to ask uh, the three ambassadors or any one of them? And I look to my screen here to see if there's anything yet. Um, and I'm sure there must be questions. Yeah. Here they're coming up. So um, let me start with the, with the, with the first question uh, about minim minimizing sorry, energy consumption in the home and a combination of efficient appliances and consumer behavior. And I think it would be interesting to hear and the question uh, to, the, to the ambassadors is, what is the role of digitalization in, uh, in doing that? You've got the appliance question, the technical question, and then you've got the question of, uh, of behavior. Luca, may I start with you? Yeah, happy to take this. We are creating simulators for consumers where they can see what will be the impact of an energy retrofitting in their house. What we discover is uh, surprisingly amazing, I will say. In average, a uh, consumer in Europe can save around 70, 80% of the energy bill by making a jump of two energy efficiency category. So we are, we are creating this kind of simulator where people can, at 11 o'clock on Saturday, check with their wife or the, or, or the husband or the partner uh, what can be done in their house. Then we are also giving them option to have access to all the banks in Europe providing this kind of loans as a mortgage or a simple personal finance because the need is different and the price is this. I think this is essential to allow access immediate access to consumer to this information. We are working with all the national hubs to create this, to allow them to pick up the best deal. I think what you said is absolutely true. We have to create an osmosis where everyone can have access to this information. Um, I think that the risk is much more uh, than energy price increase. Disposable income of consumer in Europe is really at risk. Not only energy prices, but also interest rates are growing, uh, which is impacting the most fragile uh, part of our economy. Personal loans, the price of personal loans are going seriously up, and we have to provide uh, economies or savings as much as we can in all aspects. And the digitalization can help to, by doing this, so simulator can help consumer in getting the right decision. 
Thank you very much. And anything well, you would like to add to absolutely. that? Absolutely. I mean, uh, because it's not only about the individual consumer, you then need to also aggregate the data so that you maybe you have the data of, let's say, 10,000 households that you could compare and then draw lessons from. You can't do that unless you have this data. So data is really critical here to understand what is going on. And of course, it is about consumer behavior and efficient appliances. But these efficient appliances need to be purchased at a time when, as we just said, um, um, disposable income is under extreme uh, stress. So, you know, maybe we would want to know which appliances in our house use the most energy. I mean, so my point is it really needs to be broken down into micro data and then it needs to be aggregated so that we can draw lessons and conclusions uh, from analyzing a lot of data across households and even across countries, because we know that some countries use a lot more than others. Why is that the case? So this is, you know, we, we really need um, the data. And in, a, in an additional step, I would argue we need the AI. We need artificial intelligence because it is really the large volume of data that leads to the intelligence, which then allows us to, to, to draw better, to tra draw conclusions and make better policy. In the absence of data, that is very difficult to do. Thank you very much. And if I may turn to you, Dirk, both on this, but also maybe linking into the next question on screen, which is, or from Slido, is how do we better mobilize citizens to participate actively in the clean energy transition? Since you are representing a citizen's initiative, I think you might have some thoughts there, please. Yeah. So just to, to, uh, to compensate a bit uh, the belief in, in digitalization uh, alone, it won't help us. We also need smart people with smart meters, smart devices. But we need smart people. And to give you an example of my own cooperative, which I know best, of course. So we have about 70,000 members in Flanders, 55,000 households. And on average, they consume half of the average household in Flanders uh, electricity from the grid. Uh, how come? Well, they, they made smart decisions. So they, half of them, half of these households installed solar panels on their roof. They, uh, but the ones who didn't do that, also they are 20%, consume 20% less than the average household. They have better appliances. Huh? They installed a new deep freezer or a, a refrigerator, LED lighting. And in this, in this journey to become more energy efficient, I, we believe that a trustworthy partner like an energy community is essential because the information that is available is so enormous on the internet that most people have and they get advices from different companies that, that taking a decision is difficult. So we also need people that they can trust that take them by the hand in their in their journey on getting more energy efficient. And that's where we, th we think there's a role for us as not-for-profit uh, companies, as, as cooperatives, to, to, uh, to help take them by the hand and help them in this, in this journey. And what my cooperative and others have been doing is, is showing, proving that this is the way or a way to go. Of course, we also created the platform where they can input manually or if they have a digital meter, uh, automatically their consumption, they can follow up, they can compare with similar households. Uh, uh, so there's sort of competition uh, aspect to it. it. It seems to work, so that they can uh, that they can take uh, see what when something is not normal or that they consume more on a certain aspect. So of course we have to have both, but smart tools and smart people. That's that's essential, I think. Thank you very much for bringing in that uh, individual human aspect and, and the community and trust uh, aspect uh, as, as part of how we get there uh, with the help of, of digital um, tools and, and data as well. Um, I'll ask you a first again, Luca, because there is a question that relates to uh, public financing uh, and green financial uh, instruments and climate bonds. And I wonder if it's something you would like to say something about given your your, where, you're, where you're coming from. So how can we rely less on public financing sources to enable sustainable energies? And how do we increase, enlarge the potential of climate bonds and, and green financial instruments? Do you want to say anything to that? Yeah, I mean, um, 
unfortunately, the complexity is quite high here. We have 200, dwell 200 million of dwellings in Europe that have to be renovated. The average price for this is around 40,000, 50,000 per family. So if you multiply this number, I think none of our public debt will be able to cope with this. So we, have a, we need a massive inflow, uh, inflow, inflow of uh, capital markets, investors, long-term investors, able to arrive, analyze data, do their due diligence, and decide where to invest money. Chinese, Indonesians, Americans, Canadians, wherever you want, able to invest in our retrofitting. So we need a revolution of the capital markets. We need to provide data. I think taxonomy is the right direction, uh, but complexity in taxonomy is very high. So this is the only way how we can reduce the commitment of public debt. Allow also me to say that for me, sometimes fiscal support can boost inflation. We have to be aware that, I mean, this is a speculative bomb sometimes. When you see, I mean, we have seen this in some countries, when you see a massive fiscal interaction, simply price, they double after two days. Uh, on the contrary, if you allow capital markets to step in, I mean, it's a, it's a more monetary policy intervention and can be a bit more, uh, I will say, gradual and can support more on the route, the consumer, and changing the behavior. What Dirk said is very important. If you change the mentality of a consumer at home, you change the mentality of the consumer in all their activities. So really, the, the, the retrofitting, I see another question here, is quite important because by changing one element, you have a cascade effect on their consumer cafe, uh, journey and their consumer uh, capacity. So I think, Dirk, what you said is extremely important. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Luca, if I may go... Sorry, do you want to come in on this? I have a, another question mm -hmm. for, for Dirk. Uh, there's a question from Slido about local energy markets and how liberalised local energy markets can have an impact on energy transition and if these renewable energy communities will be a first step towards a genuinely local energy market. And then I'll come to you uh, after that, Anne. Yeah. But please, uh, Dirk. Well, um, about these local energy markets, it's... For, uh, for the first time, I heard about it quite recently. Um, among our members, there are uh, renewable energy producers who only produce. And they now earn a lot of money. And they are embarrassed about this. So they, 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 they are thinking of creating funds to help citizens renovate their homes, for instance. Uh, and others uh, in the Netherlands, they are, they are um, talking to their DSO. Uh, about creating these local energy markets. To be honest, I don't know very much about it, but we also have members, about 50 of them, who are old energy cooperatives that are more than a century old, who, who had, most of them have a hydropower station in the Alps somewhere. They built the, the, the grid themselves and they sell the electricity to their members. That's a local energy market already, but that's not what we, we are aiming for. Uh, but we, we must see that, um, that uh, take, by 2050, we believe, uh, and studies have, have un un underlined this, that about 54% of the electricity we need then will be produced locally, low-voltage low grid, mid-voltage grid. And now we have a cascade system uh, where where the high voltage users, they don't pay for the mid voltage and the low voltage system. But if the electricity comes about half from that lower level, what will we do? So won't it be sensible that we can create on, on the low voltage, mid voltage uh, level, that we can create this, this uh, we can look for stability, for, uh, that we can use the flexibility, that we, can, that we can balance locally instead of bringing all the problems together at the higher level. So, we think we, that's something we must look into it, and we, we as energy communities will certainly play a role in it. Yeah. Thank you very much. And, and uh, if, uh, if, if you I want may, to come back to the, the financing, financing please. Because it is yeah. so important. Just wanted to echo what uh, Luca said about sort of the fiscal injections. Uh, because there's always sort of this inclination, let's just throw money at it. But A, it can be inflationary. Uh, B, uh, important to remember that uh, many countries in Europe have very fragile public finances. So we don't want another uh, financial crisis. Uh, thirdly, I would argue that sometimes too much public money crowds out the 
private sector. Why is this a problem? Because the private sector, at least in emerging clean technologies, operates at the technology frontier. So they would actually know best what are the technologies that might actually um, um, help us um, uh, accelerate our path uh, towards net zero. So we believe that blended finance uh, is, um, is, is a very good way of going about it. So blended finance would take from public and private, would be a combination of low cost equity, low cost loans, sometimes also grants. Uh, so I work for an organization that is also grant giving. Uh, so uh, it, it can be a combination of that. And here I would say we need to distinguish between the mature technologies, such as wind and solar, and the emerging technologies, where there is a lot of money that needs to be invested now in especially what can replace the need for natural gas, and in particular, Russian natural gas. Yeah? So that might be green hydrogen, that could be, uh, could be a long-duration energy storage. Uh, so these are the technologies now that need to urgently be de-risked. Uh, and there we need to think about what are sort of the financial modalities that we can quickly quickly do that and in a very unbureaucratic way because this is really tr now a crisis situation and we really need to wrap our minds around it. The very last thing I will say here is I've done a lot of work now in the last year on voluntary carbon markets. Um, so this could be another source of financing. Uh, because these markets are set to grow exponentially as 136 countries and 750 of the world's largest companies have made net zero pledges. So a lot of this will be done through offsets, and we know that there are major challenges to, to the offset market as it is today. So rethinking, redesigning the voluntary carbon markets where they can really help de-risk a new generation of clean technologies would be for me something I would definitely be looking yeah. Thank you very much. And Dirk, you wanted to come in? Yeah, about financing retrofit, uh, to retrofit houses. Uh, so I, I heard a very interesting um, intervention at the, at, the, at the COP in, in Glasgow of a vice mayor of the city of Ghent. Uh, they installed a sort of revolving fund. I think it was with public financing. So that you could, uh, it's, it's uh, directed to people who had enough money or could loan enough money to buy a house but don't have the money to renovate it. So you can get a loan of, uh, it's not a real loan, you can get 30, up to 30,000 euro to renovate the, the house. You don't have to pay it back but it comes back to the revolving fund when you sell the house or when, you, when it's, it's inherited by the children. And, and this seems a very interesting uh, fund that could be also financed, I think, uh, by, by banks or by, uh, by, uh, by the European uh, Investment Bank, for instance. So uh, it, it's a very promising thing because it solves a problem of this segment. Huh? Another problem is uh, the houses that are, are rented out. And so, yeah. Thank you very much for that. Any thoughts from you on that, Luca? Also, where, where will this, uh, the, the financing for the retrofitting come? Uh, and maybe linking it into another question that we have on Slido, which is the fact that we, have, we need uh, higher targets, higher levels of ambitions for both energy efficiency and, and renewable mm -hmm. energy. Um, and this will, of course, have a cost. There will be uh, investments needed. Where is the money going to come from? Any thoughts on, on that? Yeah, I think that we should really have a strategic approach to retrofitting because, I mean, finance can be there. I mean, I represent an industry that represents 8 trillion of uh, Euro, uh, euros that can be delivered quite easily. But I think there is a question on also on the workforce, on the supply chain. I mean, there is a problem of supply chain. Are we ready to have industries, small and medium enterprises, to have also green information? ESG rating for the small medium enterprises. So we have really to work on an ecosystem where all the component lenders, so financial institutions, lend, uh, small and medium enterprises will be able to work in a new environment. We need the support of the uh, European Investment Bank. I think they can do training for workforce. We need to have uh, really more people working in the sector. Digitalization can, uh, uh, but I think that the European Commission is already doing a tremendous work in coordinating all these uh, aspects. We need to do more and uh, you invite me here to be an ambassador allow me to deliver a message because that's the role of an ambassador so we are ready to do the homeworks we also feel the responsibility that uh, we are ready too late 
We need to have a, a strong coordination. We are at complete disposal of the European Commission to deliver this. Next week, we will be in Venice. I will bring all our banks making green product and let them meet with uh, global investors. Because we should also not forget that in Europe, we can do a lot, but we are only 7% of the global population. If we want to make the difference, we need to share best practices with the world. So next week in Venice, we will have Mongolians, Indonesian, Japanese coming to learn what we are doing in Europe to disclose what are the best practices. Because that's how we build a new community and we change the capital markets. If we all speak the same language, if we all have the same meter, and taxonomy can be this, we can move capital and find solutions. So this is what we are trying to do. So that's my message to the European Commission. And uh, we all feel how serious we are entering the perfect storm. And we need to put all the ammunition available for fighting climate change and uh, trying to fix the, situation, the solution as soon as possible. Thank you very much for, for those uh, messages. And I think you wanted to come, uh, come in again, if I may add a question to, uh, mm -hmm. to this one, which is about the role of large uh, companies. And there is a, a sense out there, I see in some questions, that large uh, companies essentially are not playing their part uh, more generally in the energy transition. You made the point in your opening that uh, tech, that new technology is typically also green and, and clean. Um, and I think it would be interesting to hear a little bit more uh, about that, but also to hear to the extent they are not engaging, how do we get them to engage? How do we get them to, to put their forces together to help make this necessary change happen, both to address the climate crisis, but also, of course, to help address the current energy uh, crisis? Please, that's, Anne. Uh, that's an excellent uh, question that, uh, and one that I have much reflected on. I mean, large companies tend to oftentimes be incumbents, um, conservative, um, sometimes they and in the way of innovation um, and technology breakthroughs. And uh, my message here is that in the clean technology uh, transition, this may play out very differently and actually in favor of these larger companies if they em embrace the technology disruption. What do I mean by that? If you look at the digital revolution, a lot of large companies were simply wiped out by the uh, startups uh, that emerged. And I think this is where part of the conservatism of the large companies comes from. However, in energy, my argument would be this will play out differently. Because I see from working with these startups, you don't, even if you come up with a low carbon cement, you would not have the distributional, um, the, the, the networks that the large cement company would have, right? So I think the way this may play out is that the smaller players will come up with the disruptive technology solution and the large companies will then either license or buy these companies or I don't know what, but it will be done in a more collaborative way. And this may be the opportunity here to overcome the inherent conservatism that a lot of the larger players will have. I think the Commission can play a role here to facilitate that because we will need both the disruptive startups and the large players around one table to do this quickly and in an un, as unbureaucratic way as possible because this will be the biggest transformation we will ever live through and it can only be done sort of in tandem and I would be my message to the larger companies is um, rest assured that you will not go away anytime soon. Huh? It will be rather your conservatism and blocking the technology revolution that will be detrimental to you. And I really would encourage you to think about how to bring those two together, the technology frontier and the larger companies, mm. so we can quickly accelerate this transition. Thank you very much, Anne. Uh, very interesting uh, points and points that will be addressed in our digitalization action plan. Could I stay with you for a minute just to hear your thoughts, your uh, impression or appreciation of uh, the link between the digital sector? When we talk about large companies, we've been looking at, at other at companies in other sectors. You've mentioned steel companies and, um, and um, electric car producers. Um, but in the digital sector, is there a sufficient appreciation of the energy intensive nature of that sector, of the energy intensive nature of data centers, of cryptocurrency, of uh, streaming, 
and, and readiness to do what it takes there to become yeah. more energy efficient and, and lower the consumption uh, of Absolutely. energy. I mean, so I would say, and I'm not a spokesperson for the big uh, digital companies, but from what I see is they, A, take it seriously. Uh, most of them now source uh, their uh, electricity uh, is, is essentially uh, um, uh, carbon neutral. Um, and uh, important to remember is that the big off-takers for, uh, for wind and solar are the digital companies. And so they are aware of this, I would argue. That doesn't mean it's unproblematic. It's something we have to look at, um, absolutely. But if we want to keep our data centers in Europe, uh, you know, we, we, we need to come to grips with this and also understand that the very high electricity prices and energy prices are felt by them as well. So you know, I would use it, turn it around, and look at these companies as A, a source of capital, B, a source of off-take agreements, what if you incentivize these companies to be the off-takers for long-duration energy storage or for green hydrogen or I don't know what, you know? So I would look at this as an opportunity, uh, which is just something that, uh, as you know, I, I, I like to look at the opportunity, not dismissing that it is an industry that has a very large carbon footprint, but I would argue is largely speaking aware of it, with the exception of cryptocurrencies, where I really believe we need to look at the very, very sizable uh, um, um, carbon footprint, and I would argue, at least for Europe, a minimal value uh, to our economy. You know, so if I had the choice between a vibrant digital sector and cryptocurrencies, I know what I would choose. Huh? So there is uh, something to, to be said here to also prioritize and not put everything sort of in one basket. Thank you very much, Anne. And, and indeed, uh, I think there are still questions around the energy efficiency of the sector. Mm. It might be green energy, but it is nonetheless energy. And in these it, days of energy tightness, yeah. it is something to, to look at. Okay. Can I just add one more thing, which is it's important to have in the design of the next generation of chips the sustainability aspect built into it. Uh, so I work closely with IMEC uh, just outside of Brussels and Leuven, and I know that for the next generation of computer chips, the sustainability aspect is built in. They are very much aware of it, even though right now it has a minimal carbon footprint. They know that, the, uh, that, uh, that all of this will grow exponentially. So it's built in, and here I think the Commission can incentivize by having you know, sustainability by design in this next generation of computer chips. Thank you. A good point. Dirk, there is a question uh, directly to you from, uh, from the audience, so I will turn to you to ask you um, what is the potential, how can we upscale the energy community model? The question uh, suggests that it is a promising model, and, uh, and I think we would all agree. So uh, can you help us on that, Dirk? Well, yes. Um, so I already told you that, that uh, there's some uh, scientific research that says that uh, 45 percent um, uh, of the electricity we need by 2050 could be produced locally. Uh, a large part of this uh, by, by energy communities, energy cooperatives, but there was also another study, and I take my paper, the YouGov study uh, commissioned by the European Climate Foundation that shows that, that uh, there's a, an untapped interest in energy communities Across Europe, 61% of those questions said they would be likely to join an energy cooperative if it was set up in their local area. And the highest was in Romania, for instance, what I did not expect at all. And in Italy, in Bulgaria, in Poland, and Greece, and Spain, uh, whereas now we are rather present in, in Northwestern Europe. Uh, so um, what, what is needed to, to, to uh, upscale this? Uh, we already have some, uh, some support from the European Commission. Uh, we have the Energy Community Repository. There's another one for the rural areas with a difficult name I always forget. And um, so that that's gives some technical, uh, it's a limited uh, amount of money, but we are able to give technical advice to, to uh, uh, in countries, mainly in countries where the model is not present yet, uh, mainly Eastern European countries and Balkan countries. Um, and we as a federation, we also offer this and, and uh, we have Chrome context. We get some support from foundations as well, like the European Climate Foundation and the Open Society Foundation to do this, for instance. Uh, and it's not only about, about energy, it's also about democracy, because we think that 
when, you, when people get empowered, when they, they see they can get hold on, on their energy consumption, on their, the energy production for it, uh, it, it empowers them as well as a citizen and as, as a part of a, a democracy. And, um, and there was another question, is how are we going to pay for it? What's the cost? Well, we don't see it as a cost. It's an investment with a return. And the return is also that we don't spend money an, anymore on oil, on gas, eh, coming from countries. Uh, a year or two ago, I already said this, coming from countries where we don't really like the regime. Eh? So we've seen now in Ukraine, uh, we were about to, to start with the university, Catholic University of Lviv, Lviv in Ukraine to set up uh, energy communities in Ukraine. It was stopped due to the war. Our, the people who were coming to our, our, our summer uh, summer. Um, Summer university, they, they, they are, they wear now uniforms, unfortunately. So it is, it is important that we focus on those countries where we're not present yet, that the transposition and the implementation of, the, of the, all, the, all, the, all the things about energy communities in the, in the directories are, are well transposed and are well implemented. It's a bit hard to convince regulators about the benefits uh, they're not used to it. Uh, it's on the local level. They tend to see things on, on, on the European level or on the national level. But uh, we, we really believe it's worthwhile. Thank you very much, uh, Dirk, for those, uh, for those suggestions. Um, I will turn to uh, uh, my second uh, prepared question from here. Um, uh, and I would like to ask the three ambassadors to tell us, in each your opinion, what are the areas of action that should be prioritized to spur the clean energy transition and to reinforce energy security in the European Union? So linking into what you tell us about your, your, uh, your brother or sister community in Lviv in, in, in Ukraine and the situation, uh, the war there waged by, uh, by Russia. Um, and we have uh, a significant energy security challenge in relation, in addition to the price challenge, the market challenges, and the, in addition to the climate crisis. So what should be prioritized in terms of action to, uh, to spur the, both the clean energy transition, but also to reinforce our energy security? May I start with you again this time, Luca? Yeah, that, this is a difficult question. I mean, uh, I think that, uh, for example, in our little sector, which represents 40 percent of the energy consumption, the houses, so all our, all our heating system are the major source of consumption. We can reduce, as I said before, we need the support of member states, allow me to say. For example, a very basic uh, question, a national database about energy performance certification are done on regional level. And when big lenders, they operate at national level, they have to go and knock at the door of 20, 16, three regions, they speak different languages, different IT systems. Someone says that GDPR is not allowing them to disclose data. So if you have a big bank arriving in your country, whatever country will be, and asking, I want to do it, they cannot technically do it. So I think that we have to uh, make sure that the level playing field will be there for consumer, because uh, if a lender cannot step in that country, they will pay more for the energy bill and for their retrofitting. Um, so we need to secure a level playing field among the European Union. Also avoid absolutely, allow me to say, arbitrage. Because I see the ambitions of the legislation of the Energy Performance uh, uh, Building Directive or Repower EU. But we have to be, be careful not to expose fragile people not to get a loan when they go to a bank. Just to make a concrete example, if the difference between giving money to a house A or a house G is huge, lenders will go to give money to A, not mm. to G. Mm. And unfortunately, 92% of the European population is living in a G. And probably most of them cannot afford a proper energy retrofitting. So I'm, I'm simply, as ambassador, I simply call for a very careful calibration. We fully see the ambitions. We are fully supportive. But let's be careful not to, uh, to forget social inclusion, because otherwise we lose the battle. So that's uh, energy security is also in the house of all of us. Thank you very much, Luca. Very clear message. And do you want to come in here? Sure. Um, and let me first of all say that I have been concerned that some have portrayed sort of the climate ambition and energy security as uh, being um, contradictory uh, recently. I've heard at least some voices. And of course, nothing could be further from the truth. And I think it's very important politically 
to make sure that people understand, that everyone understands that climate and energy security are really two sides of the same coin. And uh, uh, because we will come under extreme pressure here in the coming weeks and months, and uh, some will question the climate commitment. So let's be sure that we are very firm here. Um, and also make the point that was it not for renewables, we would be even more exposed in this crisis, huh? much more exposed uh, to fossil uh, uh, fuels uh, uh, and, and, uh, and also to the weaponization of uh, energy. So, so I really believe we need to be prepared for these arguments. And if we uh, want to have more energy security, as we, I know we do, we need to really double down on this path that we have chosen as Europe. Huh? I mean, Europe is a leader here, and that's very important to understand. But what that will mean is that we're not only betting on mature technologies such as wind and solar, but also on emerging enabling technologies. I already mentioned some of them, but long duration energy storage will be key. Green hydrogen will be key. Sustainable fuels, we need upgrades, massive upgrades to our grid infrastructure, to management technologies. Uh, goes back to the earlier point uh, I made about digitalization. And here, Ditte, and I say it as a former colleague, I really urge a whole of government approach, not sort of a piecemeal approach. We do a little bit here and there, whole of government. Energy security is not only about energy. This is about geoeconomics. This is about geopolitics. It's about defense. It's about industrial policy. It's about innovation, research. And there, I really believe we need a coherent, overarching approach uh, to, this, uh, to, to this biggest crisis that we have faced in recent history and that will be with us for a long time. I think we need to be very clear about this. So some of you may have seen, I have urged maybe the creation of a task force. You know, this is something in the previous commission that we did when we faced a crisis of terrorism. We created um, a security union task force. Um, when we had Brexit, we had a Brexit task force. Is to really bring all the different pieces together so that we can look at them uh, uh, really through a holistic lens. Let me, uh, and I'll conclude include on that, I uh, also want to say something about emerging clean technologies uh, that we need for greater energy uh, security. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. The good news is these technologies exist. They don't need to be created. So, uh, but what is missing is we, they don't scale yet. We don't have widespread diffusion and use of these emerging clean technologies. Um, they need to be de-risked. You spoke about some of the difficulties that you face. So imagine if you are a startup in sustainable fuels or so. You know, this is really difficult. So we need to de-risk these investments. We need an enabling regulatory environment. You're in charge of that, Ditte. But we, what, at the end of the day, the most important is that we need markets where there is a real demand for these technologies and therefore a viable commercial pathway. We can't subsidize, uh, subsidize our way to that. We need to create these markets. I said it before the session on green hydrogen. There's so much talk. There are so many announcements, but there is not yet a functioning market. We need to be very clear about this. So for the next generation of clean technologies, um, we need to understand it is simply not possible to meet our climate goals or energy security goals without that. I mean, many of you will have heard the, um, the International Energy Agency say that up to 50% of the additional emission reductions that we need by 2050 will come from technologies that are today in prototype phase. Yeah, so as I said, they exist, but they, they haven't scaled yet, and this is a really, really big, um, really, really big job. The very last thing I will say is, if you look back to the early 70s, the the the, uh, the energy crisis of the early 70s. What came out of it is today's wind and solar industry. So I think we really very honestly need to ask ourselves, what are the new industries we want to come out of this crisis? And once we have uh, the answer to that, we need to make sure it doesn't take four decades before these technologies become cost competitive, as was the case with wind and solar. So really accelerating the innovation cycle, getting the scale, getting the cost down. We speak so much about cost. This is a social program to get 
get these technologies to be cost competitive. And this is really a, a huge job. I don't envy you, uh, and, uh, but I think you sense a lot of goodwill here among all of us to help you on this journey. It's a huge Thank job, you. but also an interesting job. So, <laughs> so uh, uh, if you envy me and, this, and the rest this. of our colleagues working on energy, I think uh, uh, I, I can understand <laughs> it because you couldn't be in a better place um, yeah. uh, right now. Dirk, over to you on energy security, the role of, uh, of local uh, communities. Yeah, so uh, if we want the energy transition to succeed, we need the support of, of citizens. Uh, especially now uh, when they're hit by the very high prices and volatile prices. And uh, therefore, uh, we've been saying this from the very beginning, uh, the local ownership of, for instance, wind farms in France uh, should, be, should be there. Uh, so it, it, it doesn't work when you install wind farms uh, in, in a, low, a rural area in France and the profits go to Denmark. This will not help the, the local people. This will, uh, this will uh, put them, make them put on yellow jackets and, ex and vote for extreme left or right parties that both are now screaming for a nationalization of the electricity market, energy market. So uh, we, we need the, the, the support from all member states that, that uh, local ownership is promoted. And uh, I can I have a long text but uh, so we have the Repower EU, uh, and we we uh, we uh, we made an, an answer to this. Uh, what we think, uh, so we made a, a Repower EU for Energy Citizens manifesto. Uh, so you can find it on our website. So there's there's a lot of things. Uh, uh, the first thing is I want to read it all. Acknowledge and support local ownership of renewable energy production as a matter of securing energy supply. Uh, there are several points. Then second is support the role of energy communities in helping engage citizens for this upcoming winter and beyond. And the third is prioritize providing access to renewable energy for energy poor, vulnerable and lower income households, uh, fight against energy poverty. And then a renewable gas strategy that prioritizes the needs of citizens, not the desire of the gas industry. And uh, so we do our best to, to, uh, to spread the model across Europe and, and uh, uh, we are really engaged in doing this. Thank you very much, uh, Dirk, and thank you very much to the three ambassadors for what uh, I found has been a very uh, inspiring, interesting uh, exchange. We have gone from, uh, from digital and data, data aggregation, the role of technologies and new technologies, innovation and scaling up, to citizens level, to the local level, the individual uh, level and the need to take the right decisions as well by the human beings and in their communities to the need to have a, a well calibrated framework to ensure that financing is is available but also that it goes to all parts of society the social aspects of the transition of energy efficiency and energy performance of buildings that you uh, that you talked about uh, we have talked about emerging technologies the need to accelerate the the innovation and the market uh, phase of that. We've talked about the, the parallelism, if you will, between the uh, climate crisis and the energy crisis and the economic crisis, that they all point in the direction of reducing our consumption, um, replacing uh, energy, fossil energy with renewable energy as quickly as possible, uh, and then finding alternative uh, sources to the Russian fuels that, that we have been uh, dependent on, um, and then really a role for local communities, for energy communities that can help their communities, but also uh, others, uh, this difficult energy winter and the need to see a local benefit from those local uh, initiatives. So um, a very wide set of issues uh, and with a very, very big thanks to our ambassadors. Uh, I think we should give them a hand first before I go back to you, Anna, so you can tell us about the next point uh, on, the, on the agenda. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much, Tete. Indeed, a very interesting and very insightful discussion to be wrapping up this first half day of the European Sustainable Energy Week 2022. It's time for our lunch break now. Uh, after the one hour break, we will have two sessions dedicated to youth 
as part of the European Youth Energy Day, but worry not because all ages are welcome. First session is going to be a debate with the European Commissioner for Energy, Kadri Simpson, and 13 young people. In the second session, we will be looking at how our energy future will look like in 20 years with three projects presenting innovative technologies. So we look forward to seeing you back in one hour. In the meantime, you can have a walk in the fair. And not, don't forget that you can also network among yourselves, either live or using the online platform. So see you back in an hour. <laughs>